स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया morning uh, continuing with our new hollywood period so we are gradually coming to the end of that particular period that is the uh, as the 70s came to a close and who were the most prominent people of that period spielberg and george lucas so the most defining film of uh, or rather two films of that period one is jaws by steven spielberg his debut feature and another by george lucas which is star wars so how uh, today's class is all about how spielberg and lucas practically undid the entire new hollywood movement and what are the contribution i mean we know that they are tremendously popular they are extre commercially extremely successful but they also took back the entire endeavor to bring about a revolution in cinema the way films were made uh, can anyone tell me how this happened how, why do we hold jaws super success of jaws and star wars responsible for taking the entire movement back sandeep because they were very big budget movies okay शार्क in a beach resort town and the killer shark surfaces time and again kills people and then there are three men uh, whose mission is to hunt down the whale what's the story all about now how is the story told so my interest of course you are quite on the mark when you say that uh, jaws and star wars took uh, the movies back to the studio fold yes you are right but something also was happening by way of uh, the, by way the in, in which films were made and i don't just mean going back to the studios it was ent entirely about the author's personality yesterday we were talking about how new hollywood cinema was basically about making personal films Manif uh, they were nothing but an extension or manifestation of their own personality but where is the director's personality here i mean any anyone can make star wars or even jaws so i don't know perhaps there are many fans in this class of this genre of movies but the problem is that this there was nothing innovative about them except that it brought into the fore the genre of science fiction okay uh, the killer uh, whale is it real or fake is a mechanical shark so they must have spent quite a bit of money in creating that shark that machine so but how is the story told is anything innovative happening in the way the story is told no it's a very traditional linear story okay and basically is story of good versus evil you have three good men uh, out of those three men there is one man who is a problem he is conveniently eliminated at one point remember so the villain of the piece is gone the killer shark is killed so basically the same old story good versus evil so you are not talking about mean streets anymore you are not talking about easy rider anymore so there is a very satisfactory closure okay the movie has a so called happy ending and it's a very populist popular sort of entertainment so what's happening there giving the audience what it wants going back 
to the same old narrative. I stand corrected. Does anyone want to challenge me here? No. Okay. Now, uh, Spielberg also uh, made close encounters of the third kind. And if, uh, how many of you are familiar with that film? You are. Good. Please do watch it, girls. Yeah, it is a very entertaining movie, basically uh, shown through the child's point of view, where uh, Steven Spielberg is quite open. He said that I wanted to take a child's point of view, where the uneducated innocence that allows a person to take this kind of quantum jump. Okay, so it has the movies going back to willing suspension of disbelief. That is very important. So, you are no longer on mean, mean streets, okay, willing suspension of disbelief. You are, you, you, anything is possible in this world. E.T. can arrive any moment in your rooms. Okay, so, that kind of innocence and that is uneducated innocence, remember. Okay, we all know it is not possible. But then, there are some filmmakers who have become masters of this genre. I will give you example from our own scene. Uh, how many of you are familiar with the cinema of uh, a very commercial director like Rakesh Roshan? Who is Rithik Roshan's father? Yeah. Rakesh Roshan. Can you give me some name? Movies. Koi Mil Gaya. That is Krish and Koi Mil Gaya. They are like reworking of E.T. Even before that, you had a movie like Karan Arjun. You know, you have these twin brothers played by these you very popular stars and they are killed in the beginning of the movie and then they are reincarnated, mother is still around and then the brothers come back and uh, they take their legitimate revenge against the evil people. Same good versus evil, but do you think that is remotely possible or plausible, but it is the way the story is told that the story looks very believable. And it's such a huge commercial success. Okay, Tara, any comments here? Okay, you know these movies, right? Yeah. So yeah, it's it says a lot about the mindset of a particular kind of audience. And what was uh, new Hollywood cinema all about? There was an audience for a particular cinema, but then that audience started getting sick of the kind of films that were being meted out to them. And perhaps that was the time when the movie going audiences were ready for E.T.'s and close encounters of the third kind and Jaws and Star Wars. So, perhaps America was also undergoing some kind of socio-political cultural changes. The other day when we started our talks about new Hollywood movement, what were the major defining influences? Do you remember? Stonewall, right? So, interest in gay themes, yes, anti-Vietnam, that was the most important factor, okay. Anything else? Assassinations of major political figures, but <coughs> by the 70s, by the late 70s, what was happening in America? Who was the president? Reagan, good. President Reagan and President Reagan's era is characterized by Accesses, accesses in terms of reinforcing America's position as a superpower, unmitigated superpower, and perhaps movies reflected that. They no longer wanted those defeatist, nihilistic, pessimistic kind of cinema that people like Terence Malik were making, okay. People like Dennis Hopper want to make, uh, or people like, um, give me more examples, Hal Ashby they were making. People were no longer in those personal, small and nihilistic movies which had a strong political undertones. They don't, did not want it. They wanted entertainment, you know, pop, popcorn movies. And George Lucas is famously quoted. I mean, remember, he is the ma man who gave us American graffiti a few years ago and close on the heels of that uh, beautiful movie, which is a small, personal he gives us Star Wars. George Lucas, when he was accused of uh, 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 making cinema only for 
kids, you know it was like kiddies cinema. So, he said see popcorn cinema has always been popular, you know what is popcorn cinema? Will you call Fellini popcorn cinema? Eight and half is anything but popcorn, Bartolucci is anything but popcorn, right? So, Hal Ashby or Terence Malik, I mean you watch Days of Heaven, you will forget anything about popcorn for those two and a half hours. Okay. So, that is not pop, but George Lucas says popcorn movie has movies have always been very successful and whatever you do, no amount of new Hollywood can change the fact that people go to, a, go to the movies for entertainment. I think you were the one who once told me, why do you watch movies? That was my question and someone said that uh, for entertainment. What is the main purpose of cinema? Entertain. So, they gave the public what it wanted. This is another feature in uh, Lucas and Spielberg, uh, the father figure. Now, both these men, they came from small towns and they had a strong belief in the patriarchal system of life the patriarchal society. So, uh, in all their movies, if, the, if you read them carefully, you will find that all families are fatherless, they are marked by an absentee father and uh, the children of that family, they grow up longing for the absent dad. So, critics or scholars have read Another meaning that is along in this kind of cinema there is a longing for authority and remember new Hollywood was all anti-authoritarian. Okay, we no longer want, they were rebelling against which father? President Nixon. Okay, so, he was the villain, but now they are longing for the kind of father who can restore legitimacy and order and stability in their disrupted lives and who is that father? President Reagan. Okay, so, and nostalgia for authority, the great presidents, perhaps Roosevelt, perhaps uh, Kennedy, okay, so they longed for this, this is a nostalgic cinema which longs for an authoritarian benign figure okay, and in Reagan they found the perfect person. The plots are set in motion by the moral and emotional vacuum at the center of the home okay, and this conflict is only resolved by the father surrogates. You need not have a real biological father, but anyone who is also your surrogate father is good enough. In our cinema, having a fa surrogate father is a very common practice, no? even our ancient epics talk about the gurus. What are gurus if not surrogate fathers? So, uh, if you watch these movies, Star Wars, uh, the trilogy and Indiana Jones trilogy, which is a Spielberg movie, the, the, uh, all these movies end on a note of generational harmony. So, Indy is uh, reconciled with his father in Indiana Jones and uh, Darth Vader is revealed as Luke's father. The end. So, there is a harmony, restoration of uh, the disrupted universe. Now, um, George Lucas's Star Wars 1977 and came close on the heels of enormous success of American Graffiti. Who made American Graffiti possible? I mean, Lucas had just made uh, a, a very lukewarm movie called THX, remember it was a sci-fi. American Graffiti, yesterday we touched upon it was uh, uh, directed by Lucas, but uh, who, who gave the movie enough pull? Coppola. Okay, Coppola because he was already high on the success of the Godfather and that entire generation of directors, they looked up to Coppola. He was the father figure, he was the hero and people did not believe in American graffiti at all, the producers and all and they felt what is this kind of film which is taking us back to the 50s and a very feel good movie. Although very personal and small budget and innovative in the in sense of its narrative and music. Remember we were talking about the soundtrack, 
So, there are lots of redeeming features in American graffiti, but there were no buyers, no takers. So, Coppola lent the desired you know, weight to the movie. He said he will, he is, he stands to uh, guarantee for the movie. Okay, and Coppola made it possible. So, but what happened at the, uh, by the time Star Wars got released and Apocalypse Now got released, what happened? The equations changed and after that Lucas had no time for Coppola. That is the way it happens. Spielberg, people who had helped him come up and then after late, there, there came a point, especially after Indiana Jones. And they said that it is not the same Spielberg anymore. So, the new Hollywood forked parts, you know what is a fork, okay. Everyone else went one way and Spielberg and Lucas went the other way. It is not like they did not desire to be authors, but what they desired more was commercial success. So, that is what you have to remember, okay. Why did new Hollywood movement end? Because People uh, who could have brought about the change, they changed okay, and they gave into the forces of commerce. Okay, and when you think money, then of course, art suffers. Uh, Star Wars is also known for, uh, uh, of course, it is an original material, yes, it is not an adaptation of any <coughs> pre existing novel. Or and uh, something else happened which is very interesting and only George Lucas had the vision or foresight to say it, merchandising. Okay, so, you had t-shirts and you had toys and you still have, whenever Star Wars is released or remade or whatever, you get all those R2s, R2D2s and all those to toys, right. Okay, so, that became a big, so toys, t-shirts, uh, books, everything led to serious profit and Lucas had the complete control over that and he was the first to do so. So, Lucas's enormous wealth came from more from merchandising than from the movie itself, because the movie was produced by the studio. So, a chunk of profit was taken away by the studios. How he got rich? Through merchandising and no one else had thought about this way of making money before Lucas. Okay. So, um, character success recipe of Star Wars, of course, hugely uh, likable characters. Remember, new Hollywood cinema was all about characters, uh, very flawed characters, very human characters. They were not larger than life. That was the major feature that characters should be as close to real people as possible. But now, who can be close to Darth Vader? or Luke Skywalker or one Kenobi. So, larger than life, larger than life characters and remember this is what classic Hollywood was all about. A big, a great hero, highly principled, high, high minded hero, he emerges and cures the society of all its evil, going back to the roots. Okay. So, feel good and happy ending, feel good cinema with happy ending and follows the trajectory of the hero's journey, okay, which is so pop, such a popular motif, or such a popular trope in most cinema, most popular cinema, right. You would not find any tra uh, such trajectory in easy riders, but you have such things in the searchers, John Ford searchers, right, hero's journey, hero makes a journey and at the end. Um, he emerges a bigger hero than poss than ever before. That is what Star Wars did. Paul and Kiel did not like these movies uh, typically and of course, they were not movies made by Robert Altman or Warren Beatty. So, she used the term the infantilization of film industry. What does it mean? Dumbing down, dumbing down of film industry. So, Star Wars, just a brief overview of the journey of the hero. I know you have already done that several times. Uh, this is uh, 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 Heroes with a Thousand Faces. Who is the author? 
Joseph Campbell. Okay, I am taking you back to the point where we started. Hero with a thousand faces. Remember when we were doing narrative. So, hero starts his journey. There is a departure. There is a call to adventure. And Luke receives a message from Princess Leia. First, he refuses. He is uh, fearful of leaving his old comfortable life. And look at the trajectory that Lord of the Ring follows. Okay, so there is a pattern that most blockbusters follow, and this is this is a, a template. So, uh, beginning of the end of New Hollywood. What were the features? One major, of course, Star Wars and uh, Indiana Jones and Jaws, they dumbed down the audience, that is one feature, but there was another important thing, there was another more damaging factor for uh, the end of uh, the new Hollywood cinema. Directors became megalomaniacs and there is, there are any number of examples of this. If you read into the history of that period, you will understand all those great directors they made uh, a couple of good movies, great movies, movies which have come to be a part of canon, but then they just fell by the wayside. Okay. Dennis Hopper after Easy Rider, there were, people were clamoring for him, begging him literally to make another movie. He came up with the last movie in 1971 and it's, uh, I do not know if you have watched the movie, the last movie. And it's, it was so attacked and reviled by critics. Uh, you know, they have a thing called preview audience. So, they decided to, pre what is preview audience? Before releasing it formally, they show it to a select group of people in order to gauge responses. So, if people during the preview say, no, the picture does not work, okay, you need to change this, that. So, usually directors, your filmmakers comply. Now, uh, Dennis Hopper decided because he felt that a chunk of his audience, uh, all his loyal supporters, they belong to college campuses, you know, all high on rock and roll and uh, the counterculture movement. So, he really, he previewed the movie to a group of college students and they were outraged. They, uh, one of the uh, uh, female students, she was so appalled by the way women were portrayed in the film. She punched him on his nose and he started bleeding and she said she is going to kill him. And the producer who was there with Dennis Hopper, they said, he said that, uh, you know, suddenly, I, immediately I thought of the scenario from Tennessee Williams play, Suddenly Last Summer. You know what happens in Suddenly Last Summer? Okay, there is this young man who finds himself in a group of, among a group of cannibals on a remote island and they tear him to pieces and <laughs> eat him up. That is the way suddenly last summer ends. Okay, it starred uh, Monty Clift, he played the psychiatrist, not the dead man. Uh, Catherine Hepburn, who plays the mother of this dead boy and Elizabeth Taylor, the love interest of this dead boy. Okay. So, the story is this, the, how this man finds himself uh, inexplicably in a group of islands where he is attacked by these cannibals who tear him apart and eat him up. Okay. And this is what the producer felt, that I suddenly felt that these students are going to <laughs> rip both of us apart and is going to be a rehash of suddenly last summer. So, they said, he asked uh, Dennis Hopper that forget the movie, let us first get out of this place. So, that was the response to the maker of Easy Rider. Okay, and after that, it was a constant, consistent downhill for Dennis Hopper. Till Blue Velvet, he, he was just lost in oblivion. Right? Okay. Bogdanovich, he made a string of failures. Daisy Miller, Nickelodeon, uh, he tried, he experimented with various genres and soon became a laughing stock. Uh, William Friedkin, who had made French Connection and The Exorcist, he made, uh, he remade rather 
Wages of Fear that was a Cluzo movie uh, and the, uh, the remade version was called Sorcerer, it was a monumental flop. Why? Because they overspent, they, they, they just would not stick to the budget, they really thought that they have become authors. Okay. And Scorsese's New York, New York, uh, he, may, he had made a couple of successful critically acclaimed films, who is that knocking, Mean Streets, Taxi Driver. But New York, New York, he departed from his tried and tested genre, which was the gangster, the street genre. And New York, New York is about, what is it about, starring De Niro and Lisa Manali? It is a musical. It is about a couple uh, who are into music, New York, New York. So, and it was a major flop as well. Now, Apocalypse Now, 1979, again, although people had great expectations from the movie, I mean, Coppola was always seen as the last man standing. Hmm. If not you, then who will? I mean, that was the attitude of. Uh, the new Hollywood filmmakers towards Coppola, they almost deified him. And they said, Apocalypse Now is a great story, the script has been in circulation. But they said, only one man can make it possible, that is Coppola. So, he took it upon himself that, yes, okay, I am the last man standing indeed and I should make it. He decided to give it a very surrealistic treatment and he is quoted to have said, the jungle will look psychedelic, okay, because that is the entire counterculture movement all about fluorescent blues and if you remember the jungle in apocalypse now, yellow and greens and the war is essentially a Los Angeles export like acid rock. So, that is the look he wanted to uh, give to the movie. It was shot in Philippines among very unfriendly conditions and the whole thing went over budget. They shot a lot and then they did not know how to edit it out. So, they spent years in editing the movie. So, one reason for the decline of these directors was arrogance, too much too soon. Most of them got achieved the superstardom while they were still in their thirties. Okay. They believe, they started believing in the myth of their own greatness and genius. And one feature that is common to all of them was that all of them thought of themselves as serious authors. But then serious authors in Europe, what kind of movies were they making? Not really, serious authors in Europe. The Godas, the Truffauts, the Fellinis, Bartolitis, they always made at middle of the road kind of cinema. Okay, they never change tracks so drastically. Okay. Success never went to their heads the way uh, it went to the collective heads of these people, so, who made only one or two successful films, but then it seriously started believing themselves to be the geniuses and greatest authors of all time. And then what happened? What was the upshot? What was the result of this? Hollywood was taken back in time to those, those times where producers were in control. So, the age of the directors in control came to an end, okay, which is said. And after that, for a very long time, you just would not remember, they all became star, movies became star vehicles. The other day we were talking about high concept cinema, take a couple of big stars, go to a big major studio and make a movie with is a, a very well established actor okay, and that is what movies became by the, uh, by the 80s. Michael Cimino, who is uh, the dear hunter had got him so much of critical and commercial acclaim. He came up with a very over ambitious bloated epic, Heaven's Gate, the Heaven's Gate starring Christopher Walken 
and Chris Christopherson. The movie is a, a western and it was such a dud that after that no one made a western till Kevin Costner came brought it back with Dances with Wolves. Okay, so that See, there is a difference. No, no, no. Let me tell you, there is a difference between a typical spaghetti. So, unforgiven, unforgiven is a western, the classic western, not a spaghetti, not a Sergio Leone kind of a spaghetti western. It is a proper western, but it followed dances with wolves. It did not come before that. Yeah. So, that is it. So, uh, having, Generally, if you look at film history, Heaven's Gate is regarded as the movie that brought new Hollywood cinema to in it, okay, because it was so over budget, it was so big, it was so expensive that this movie almost shut down the studio, okay, bankrupted the studio. And after that, producers and studios realized that we had given too much power to uh, a bunch of directors and this cannot continue. Uh, when I started talking about the new Hollywood period, you remember I talked about three people, BBS, Bob Raffelson, Bert Schneider, Steve Blomer. Bert Schneider was uh, the man who made the entire new Hollywood uh, movement possible with his funding and financing of movies like Easy Rider and uh, Drive, he said, The Head, etc., uh, Five Easy Pieces. But who ruined him? Terence Malik, when he, put, uh, when he directed Days of Heaven, because we are told that Terence Malik uh, would keep on shooting the movie and would not stop and he would shoot as and when it suited his mood. And Bert Schneider was so much in debt that by the end of 1976, he just decided to sell off the company because he was tired. He, after all, they were trying to promote the so-called indie cinema and with this kind of attitude, the producers, even those producers whose hearts and minds were in the right place, they could not go on supporting this kind of attitude because directors went out of control. So, the last word uh, on the entire thing is by Robert Altman. In the 90s, he said, I went to a multiplex and what do I find there? <laughs> the lost world, which is Jurassic Park, my best friend's wedding, con air, face off, movies have just become a big amusement park, is the death of film. I am very sure that for many of you, these are uh, the best films I ever made. <laughs> okay, for, I am very sure because when people talk Hollywood or they say, oh, we watch international films and then you talk to them, what do they watch? So, they come up with Jurassic Park and Jaws and Con Air and Titanic. Yeah, everyone talks about Titanic. Like, I think James Cameron is one man who has taken, who I mean, if Michael Cimino <laughs> brought the death of the new Hollywood movement, I think the coffin in the nail was uh, stuck by James Cameron. <coughs> Maria Lucas, who is she? John Lucas's wife, okay, she was also his editor and then in the 90s she says, right now I am just disgusted by the American film industry and, star and she admits Star Wars is partly responsible for this the movie which her own husband directed and she edited. Okay. So, much of the discredit for the state of cinema that we find in today is, it, it does go to Steven Spielberg and George Lucas, although Spielberg occasionally tries to redeem himself, because he has made money, you see, okay. he has made his money, so he need not experiment all that much, so he can afford a Schindler's List. Why? And Schindler's List was also, um, perhaps he, there is a serious filmmaker inside him. So, he must have wanted to give vent to that urge. 
at the same time the same director came, comes up with the lost world jurassic park okay so that means that commerce there is one eye always fixed towards the commercial aspect of cinema and i am very sure that after lincoln also there will be some sci sci fi fantasy in the pipeline and this brings us to the ultimate author now why do we think that woody allen is an author who survived the test of time i mean even today if you watch his midnight in paris you know yes it's a woody allen movie okay so woody allen started small and remained small and continued doing that personal kind of films so he was one filmmaker who never gave in to the gross commercial aspects of filmmaking so he didn't let the entire hollywood game affect him and perhaps that explains the secret of his longevity woody allen who uses his own materials and his scripts makes intensely personal films and all his films still are extension of his personality i mean we know what woody allen is all about and when you see a woody allen hero you know that's a woody allen hero okay so his own kind of uh, films uh, there are some aberrations for example match point okay you watch the movie and you feel ah uh, okay so it's a woody allen movie but then yeah uh, uh, that's that is, movies like that remain an exception but by and large he has been faithful to his vision and he has been very consistent about his style of film making so uh, how many of you have watched any hall quite a few i will take you to this movie and just watch a, a, the first few moments of the film it's from manhattan it's a, a late 70s movie directed and starring woody allen you liked what you saw okay do watch manhattan is one of his best okay you can rank it alongside any hall and uh, that uh, that movie what is it the crimes and uh, crimes and misdemeanors crimes and mid misdemeanors and <coughs> manhattan you know if you want to just make a list of his he's very prolific yeah yeah he's never they never a dull moment but if you count his best three to three or four movies in manhattan ranks among them it's that good can you would you like to comment on the editing technique okay the narrative and the music what is woody allen trying to do i am trying to draw your attention to the fact that it's a very very uh, austere movie so woody allen why is he he is the only one who is truly an author he has never remade a movie he always writes his own movies he is never dependent on someone else's material Okay, he is involved. We that those are the broad features of an author. Okay, he is always involved in all the major aspects of filmmaking. Okay, and there is a strong signature authority there. So, what makes this movie so? What makes this opening shot so important? What is strikes? Yes. Mm. But that's again a recurring motif in Woody Allen, right? So you have those panoramic shots of New York, the Brooklyn Bridge, the Central Park, Gaganai Museum, Broadway. Okay, so those are the typical haunts of Woody Allen's movies. Okay, that's where the character. I mean, characters are always there in museums or in. Now, most of these characters are upper upper middle class, either wasps or wasps or Jews. Okay, so they are always 
uh, found in a particular society. So, they are not, they do not belong to the mean streets, right. So, they they uh, his characters inhabit uh, um, a particular uh, space and that is something you f always find in his films. Um, he is uh, intellectually and culturally extremely vibrant, very dynamic that reflects as well. I mean you expect that from a Woody Allen movie and you get it, ok. He, he tells you from the beginning, at the beginning itself that this is, this is a movie, uh, this is uh, uh, a city which is, uh, I can hear the sound of Ira Gershwin's music, ok. That is again a repeated feature in all his films, ok. Interest in classical music, ok. Use of voice na uh, over, ok. It is not just dialogue, it is a voice over, ok. And that conflicted personality that you have been say, finding from the beginning is the days of any hall in all his films. Anything else? He establishes New York as a character, not just as a background for the movie. Right. So, Manhattan, not just New York, but yeah, he is talking about New York, but then Manhattan emerges as a very powerful entity, very powerful character in his films. Okay, uh, uh, with the, if you take New York out of his films and the characters would not be what they are, they will turn into something else. So, the city is extremely important in the Woody Allen movies. And uh, also shows through music like how grand is uh, the place. Uh, the grandeur of the, the yeah. so the, even when he, you, you know he is an, he is an author that you understood right, he is an author who is an author in the movie, he is writing a book and the, and chapter 1 the kind of uh, uh, you know contradictions, the contradictory feelings he has about his city. It is many things to him. He's all he always feels very vibrant because it's not New York City. Okay, so he, his personality is shaped, forged by his city. So that city is therefore a very important feature. Uh, Woody Allen too, like most uh, authors of his generation, was deeply influenced by the uh, European uh, cinema. He says that I have made perfectly decent films, but so far I have not yet made 400 blue blows or Jules and Jim or even eight and half and that for all new Hollywood filmmakers that is the touchstone, that is the benchmark, those are the kind of movies we should be making, otherwise we are all very ordinary, that is what he has always believed in. Um, one authorial aspect of his cinema is his cinematography and you will find very distinctive Woody Allen features in uh, most of his films. He has collaborated with uh, Gordon Willis and Carlo de Palma quite frequently and visuals in Manhattan as you just saw these visuals. Did you notice that the movie begins, but there are no title credits ok. What kind of editing uh, technique do you find? It is a montage ok. Please keep going back to your earlier classes ok. He, he makes a very effective use of the montage technique and why is montage in interesting here or in significant here? Because it gives you a very good uh, overview of the city, no, snapshots from the city. So, it is important to use that technique here. Again, like most of his films and like uh, in the true tradition of the author cinema, Manhattan is also shot on location and any hall and if you watch his other films, most of them are shot on location including those three British movies, ok. There is a, a, apart from match point, what are the two other? Three, it is a trilogy of British movies, just do your homework 
and then of course it, that it was followed by uh, Vicky Cristina. Okay. Most movies, uh, uh, almost all his movies are shot on locations. Manhattan, he uses the iconic bridge shot. This is an iconic shot, if you know the movie, okay. sitting on a bench under the bridge. The famous planetarium visit and the dialogue there. Woody Allen movies also are noted for their sparkling conversations. I do not know if you have followed the movies very well, you will understand that how well dialogue is interwoven with the narrative. Okay. And uh, <coughs> we do not have much time today, so I let me just quickly bring the lecture to an end. He, uh, he was one of the uh, most uh, successful filmmaker to break the so called fourth wall, okay, using that idea of alienation. Okay. In any hall, for example, as he is uh, in the flashback and he is talking about his lousy, miserable childhood, you know, how his parents and how his teachers messed him up, all Woody Allen persona are messed up characters, right. And every invariably the blame is on parents and teachers and he is narrating the flashback and he is sitting among a group of sc school children and you do not see Woody Allen as a kid, you see him as a fully grown Woody Allen as he was then, a fully grown up character sitting amidst a group of school children. So, that is breaking the fourth wall. Martian McLuhan makes an appearance, remember in any hall they are talking about, yes and then McLuhan appears, okay. that is one good example of breaking the fourth wall, talking to, the, starts talking to the audience, which was something that was introduced by people like Godard. If you watch Breathless, the hero constantly talks to the audience okay. and in uh, Woody Allen you often find that happening. So, Woody Allen, one filmmaker who has survived the you know ups and downs of the new Hollywood movement. So, the new Hollywood movement got over, but there, there are some people who are still around Scorsese for one, Woody Allen for one. Okay. So, that brings us to the end of, we have done a series of lectures on this topic and from tomorrow onwards we will start with postmodernism and cinema. Thank you very much.